God did my life this morning, uh, just getting us ready for this afternoon. Uh, when that song popped up, this little light of mine, uh, you got to be kidding me. And instantly got happy. <laughs> I saw Melchizedek walking in where we're going. And, and the, the, I, I didn't want to laugh because it, it's light bulbs. <laughs> and, and so we're taking the light of the Lord this afternoon. I uh, have two testimonies. Uh, Dave, if you'll come up. Dave Day, the president of Melchizedek uh, in Albany. And he's going to give a quick testimony of how people are finding him to find Jesus. Uh, and then we have Ethan who's going to uh, give the message afterwards. So, uh, Lord bless you. Morning. Thank you. 
letting God into your life, deep in your heart. You ask him to help you clean that stuff up because you can't do it. And, you know, we spent a few more minutes together in the spirit of prayer. Now, can I have a few more? You going to be okay? Um, so, culturally, you know, you just saw this, this island scene, all right? Now, these are people, you know, Bill and Jen, they form in, they, they adapt themselves to that culture. And so these people are prepared to hear from people who are part of their culture. And that's very much what we do. There's a, a, a story from, I think it was the 1950s, of Nate Saint and Jim Elliott going to Ecuador to reach natives there. And they were murdered by the natives. But their families, their wives, came in behind them, adapted to that culture, and reached those people for Christ. And many years later, Steve Saint, the son of Nate, came to our church and told the story. And immediately, I knew that's what we do. That's what the Melchizedek's do. You know, we we go in and we adapt to a culture and bring Christ to these people from where they're coming from. Amen. Right? And that's the reason I went there with that was this individual needed to hear from somebody from his culture. You know, my belief system is he was ready to get saved two weeks early. The pastor could have led him to Christ, Chris could have led him to Christ, the son could have led him to Christ. And Chrissy corrected me and said, you know, he needed to hear from me. You know, because I understand where he's coming from. And he knew that look in my eyes, which he did his Christ. One more thing. Just a little bit of follow up. We haven't got very far into this thing, but um, he's a guy who's probably not technologically savvy, maybe a little bit less than me. Phone and whatnot. So I'm in my office the next day on Monday, and my phone rings. And I look at it, and I think I, I think I know who this is, and I answer it. Nobody. Hello? Nobody there. Hello? Jim. Oh. Oh, I'm so glad you called me. I said, no, you call me. <laughs> he goes, I just set up my voice on my phone. Right? Um, so he goes, he still continues to come so glad you called me. And we end up having a conversation about him. How his, basically his next 24 hours at home, which was a struggle. And he's in a real big, he's in a real battle. So just uh, keep this in visual prayer. Anyway, the point of the story is, you know, God is on the move. You know, Amen. Uh, whatever culture, subculture you might be involved in, whether it's a neighborhood thing, a hobby thing, or whatever it happens to be, you, know, you are uniquely prepared to reach a certain group of people. And just be prepared for God to do it. Amen. Amen. Now, I recommend you have to buckle your seatbelts because uh, Give me one second, folks. I better turn this mic on. Am I on? Yeah. Yes. Good. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Last but not least, good morning. All right, awesome. My name is Ethan Manning, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, just real quick, because I'm, I'm a little nervous, and it, uh, it always happens at first, which I like. I like a healthy dose of fear and uh, nerves and jitters, but do we have any people that are currently employed right now? Currently employed. Just put your hand up if you're currently employed. 
Awesome. Uh, before I get started, I'm just going to take like four of you that had your hands up. If you could just say who you are and what you do. Don't be shy. I'll... Outstanding. Engineering. And I, forgive me, folks, I lost a little bit of hearing in uh, my time in Iraq, so sometimes I have trouble hearing, so I do actually try to look at people's mouths and see what they're saying. So can I get two more? Maybe someone from over here? Nice. Outstanding. And last but not least, medical biller. Outstanding. Father God, I just thank you for today. I thank you for each one of the men and women that you've drawn here, Lord. Um, I pray that I'd be a fool for you, Lord, a fool for you today. I pray for each soul that's here. I pray for anyone that's watching online, Lord. Please, Father, we, uh, we, we ask that one would pass from death to life. And if it's just a, someone that is already a believer, already a professor of the faith, Lord, but is just kind of a little wayward, then maybe this, this is the message for them, Lord. But I thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I thank you for the Melchizedek, Lord. I thank you for just everything you've done in their lives, and, and because of that, the things that they've done in my lives, Lord, and just some of, the, just some of the, the stories that we have, Father, only you could create, the miracles that we've seen, the confirmation on the way here, Lord. Uh, it's awesome, Father, to be a servant of you, Lord, and I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that we would embolden this church and this community to go out and make tracks for you, and we just say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. What does your life reflect? That's the title of today's sermon. What does your life reflect? What does my life reflect? I want to first tell you, though, that the Christian life is a supernatural life. And what I mean by that, it is, is it is impossible for you to live this life out on your own. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. And thank God that the moment we place our faith, our trust, our hope in Jesus Christ, he gives us that gift. He gives us that gift, and there's no waiting period whatsoever Looking around this room, I see a lot of faces that I don't know. And while I may not know you personally, I know that sitting here right now in this room, there's someone that's struggling, struggling with maybe an addiction, a stronghold. Looking around this room, there might be someone here that is struggling with drugs or alcohol. Now, before you come off the rails and say, no, 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 that's me. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. Let me list a few other things that either I have struggled with or that I have observed Christians struggling with other addictions or strongholds in their life. So I said drugs and alcohol, and most likely there is someone in this room that struggles with those. But if it's not that, what about pain medication? What about food? What about TV? What about shopping? What about spending? What about your phone? What about pornography? What about lust? What about gossip? What about pride? Maybe you struggle with dishonesty or telling the truth. Maybe you exaggerate things, puff up the story. I can relate to that. Maybe it's your language when you're mad or when no one's around. Maybe your struggles with anger or rage. Maybe you can't forgive someone, or maybe you can't forgive yourself. Maybe it's depression, guilt, shame. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're hearing that nagging, whispering voice, that lying voice that is in your head saying that you'd be better off here, better off not here, better off dead. Maybe that voice is saying that God doesn't really love you. Maybe you think that you're beyond hope or that you can't change or that you're the only one with this issue, this problem or this stronghold. Brothers and sisters, I am here today to tell you that if you're hearing any of those voices, those are lies from the pit of hell. Those are lies from Satan himself. And to be honest, I've struggled with each one of those examples in my life. Those examples dominated my life. And those examples I've, uh, I've listed have dominated the lives of believers. It was not until I humbled myself. It was not until I became a servant of the Most High that I was able to overcome I was able to overcome because I got out of the way. It was not until I humbled myself in obedience to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that I was able to be victorious. I had to take a stand and fight. But before I could do so, I had to first surrender. 
Now, as a former combat Marine, I'm a disabled combat vet. I served with 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines in 2004 in Iraq. I know how counterintuitive it is to say that you have to surrender in order to fight. But in order for the Christian to fight effectively, in order for the Christian to combat sin effectively, you must first become a slave. You must first become a captive of Jesus Christ. Then we can fight effectively. Then we have the true weapons of war. As I was preparing for today's message, I was struck with the fact that it doesn't matter how old you are, where you come from, what you look like, what nationality you are, what you have in your pockets, what you drive, our attacks all come in the same form. Our enemy, Satan, is so sneaky, so sinister, that he uses a little bit of truth and then he incorporates a huge lie. Let me give you an example. When I hear the voice, that voice in my head that says, Ethan, you can't change. Ethan, you can't overcome. It's actually the truth. Does anyone know why that is? Because I'm not God. And apart from Jesus Christ, I can do nothing. But where Satan stops, though, where the enemy stops, where our adversary stops, though, is in finishing the sentence. If Jesus Christ was writing the sentence, this is how it would read. Ethan, on your, own, on your own, you can't change. Ethan, on your own, you can't overcome. But, and I say but, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can. That's how Jesus Christ would finish the sentence. That's how Jesus Christ finishes the sentence for us believers. Brothers and sisters, we have to be able to discern the voice of our enemy and the voice of our Father. And so how do we do that? How do we do that? How can we be sure that we're following the right voice? This is serious stuff, brothers and sisters. We are talking about eternity here. So how do we tell which voice we should be listening to and obeying? How? Glad you asked. With this book right here. This book, the Bible. If you're not hearing from God, then start reading your Bibles. If today is the first time you picked up your Bible since last week, do you really expect to fight effectively? Do you really expect to fight and hear from God? No, unless he's telling you to pick up your Bibles. Do you really think, do you really believe that you will fight if you're not in the Word effectively? Of course not. A Christian who is not in the Word is like someone who wants to fly a plane but has never been to flight school. It's like a firefighter who can't fight fires. It's like a police officer who can't make arrests and can't protect the public. It's like a teacher who can't teach. So if you have your owner's manual, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. I'm going to cover some other verses today, but they're going to illustrate these verses. These have become some of my favorite verses. And if you don't carry a Bible, I would suggest that you start carrying one, especially to church. Verse 32 starts, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. What does your life reflect? Is Jesus the center of your life? Think about this. Does your life reflect the life-changing power that Jesus Christ gives us when we surrender our lives to him? Or does your life look like everyone else's with, with a little Jesus added on Sundays or when people are watching? Do you seem to find time for Jesus only when the things are going bad or at their worst or if you need or want something? Brothers and sisters, while it's great to call out to God when we're in need, when we're in desperate times, when we're when we're crying out to him, Lord, we need help. We also have to cry out to him when things are good. We also have to acknowledge him when things are going great. In verse 33, it says, But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. We have to look at the word deny and what it means. The great biblical scholar and theologian, Marion Webster, that's a joke, lists the following synonyms to illustrate the word deny. To contradict, to negate, to refute, to go against, to refuse to acknowledge. Brothers and sisters, this is a warning to us. We have Jesus warning us, telling us that if we deny him here on earth, he will deny us before the Father in heaven. Can you think of a worse thing to hear? Could you imagine standing before Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and having him say, away from me, I never knew you? 
The scriptures tell us that many will hear those horrifying words. They're found also in the book of Matthew chapter 7, and it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The scriptures are full of warnings, brothers and sisters. The scriptures are full of warnings. In the book of Mark, chapter 8, 38, it says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man also be ashamed, and when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. In the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 12, it says, If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. So do you think about it often? Have you thought about it? What does your life reflect? Does your life acknowledge Jesus Christ? Does it really reflect Jesus Christ? Does my life so show that I am sold out for Jesus Christ? Or is there something else? Is there something else in our lives that is currently taking the place that Jesus Christ should hold? Brothers and sisters, we have to be ruthlessly honest in this evaluation. Let me be clear. I'm not talking about a one-time profession or confession of faith, or even a denial of faith. These verses are not talking about that. They're talking about the pattern of life, the lifestyle of a Christian. So I ask you sitting here today, what does your life reflect? In the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, we have the Apostle Paul saying, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Brothers and sisters, words do matter, and they contain great power. Life and death... Our words show the condition of our heart. Jesus tells us it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles us, but what comes out. So what is coming out of your mouth? Is it professing that Jesus is Lord? Or do your words deny him? What are your words and actions like? The word confess is not past tense, meaning you can't say, well, I was saved 20, 30, 40 years ago and I confess that Jesus is Lord. No, absolutely not. This is present test. This means that anyone who professes the faith is to be professing, confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord with their mouth and with their actions. This is the lifestyle of a born-again Christian. It is also our response to his promise that if you confess present tense and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Brothers and sisters, we have to be ruthlessly honest about this evaluation. We're talking about eternity here. In the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. In 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 13, we have the Apostle Paul telling Timothy, and this applies to us today, follow the pattern of sound words you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. There are many other instances in the Bible, brothers and sisters, where we're told to imitate, to hold on to, to put into practice, to follow, to mold into, to do, to go. So what is your pattern of life? What is my pattern of life? Our pattern of life? What does your life reflect? Is Jesus the center of it? Take Peter, for example. Peter denied Jesus from the scriptures not once, not twice, but three times. Three times we read that he denied Christ with his mouth. He had three individual instances of denying the Father, and yet he was restored. We see this exchange, this interaction, this conversation between Jesus and Peter in the book of John, chapter 21, verse 17, and I'll read it for you. He said, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved, he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And three times Peter answers yes. Each time Peter is asked a question, it tears deeper into his heart. But you see, although Peter denied Jesus with his mouth on three occasions, Peter's pattern of life did not. Peter's lifestyle did not back up his talk. Peter's life reflected the opposite of his denial. Do you get that? Although Peter denied Jesus with his mouth, his lifestyle did not. Yes, he uttered the words, I don't know this man. But up until that point, his life, since meeting Jesus, had been holy about following Jesus Christ, professing Jesus Christ, confessing Jesus Christ. His lifestyle did not back up his denial. 
And this was all before Jesus was murdered. And brothers and sisters, when Peter saw the resurrected Christ, he never looked back and he was ultimately put to death for his faith. And history says that Peter demanded to be crucified upside down as he did not feel worthy enough to be crucified like Jesus Christ. We have all denied Jesus at some point in our lives, brothers and sisters. It's easy to pick on the apostles. It's easy to pick on the Pharisees. It's easy to pick on the Sadducees. But let's look in the mirror and evaluate ourselves first before we try to evaluate others. Here's why. There's another example, brothers and sisters, of a person who spent approximately three years in the very presence of the living God. The life that I'm speaking about is Judas. Judas denied Jesus, but why wasn't he restored? Why wasn't he restored like Peter? We read in the scriptures that he gave the money back. I'm sure he felt remorse, guilt, shame, and he ultimately killed himself. But why wasn't he restored? While he identified himself as a follower of the living God, while his words may have reflected Jesus on the outside, inside, his heart did not. While he uttered the words that he was a follower, and the, on the outside, he may have even looked like a true follower, a true disciple of Christ. On the inside, he was dead, destined to spell, spend eternity in hell, dead in his sins. That is why we have to be careful, brothers and sisters, when we judge people. We judge by human standards. God looks in and judges the heart. So what is the condition of your heart as you sit here today? What is the condition of your heart? In the book of John, we have Mary anointing Jesus with an expensive ointment or perfume. This is an account of the Gospels you may be familiar with. And there's an exchange between Judas and Mary that I believe reflects the true condition of Judas's heart. It's found in the book of John, chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, and I'll read it to you. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So any profession of following Jesus uttered by Judas was never really meant. So here we have the true reflection, the true pattern of Judas' light coming to life. His lifestyle did not back up his words. His lifestyle did not reflect the heart of Jesus Christ. Judas was not sold out for Jesus. We can all point a finger at Judas, but what if I was a fly on the wall at your home, your place of work? What if I asked your husband or wife, your kids, grandkids, your neighbors, your boss, what would they say? What would they say your life looks like? And if that thought makes you uncomfortable, if that thought makes you cringe, you have to ask yourself why. We know that to be denied before the Father means you are disqualified, not legitimate. I'll say it simply, you're going to go to hell. Brothers and sisters, we always have to be careful and watchful as we await the return of Jesus Christ. We have to be careful and watchful for our enemy. Judas walked with Christ, talked with Christ, broke bread with Christ, touched and smelled the living God, saw the miracles, the healings, and was still lost to spend an eternity in hell. We have to be ever more watchful as we await the return of Jesus Christ. Judas walked with Jesus for years and was still lost. Look at the American church today. And I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about any church. How many people are just going through the motions? They bear no real fruit at all and no real relationship with the Father. And sometimes you can spot them because they're not getting well. They're stuck in the same state, the same pattern of life. You see no evidence of the life-changing power of Jesus Christ within them. And if this is you here today, if this is you sitting here today, don't feel condemned. Don't feel judged. Take a stand. Today is a day of salvation, brothers and sisters. If you're here today or you're watching online and you know that your heart is not in line with your words or your actions, hallelujah. Conviction is a beautiful thing. And when he convicts us, it shows that we are his children. Don't run from it. Run to it. I've often heard people say, oh, I'm offended or I feel condemned or I feel judged. Too bad. Jesus Christ was the most radical, offensive person to ever walk the face of the earth. The message of the cross is foolish to those that are perishing. So ask yourself this, are you a fool? Are you a fool for Jesus? Because you're going to be one or the other. 
In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 11, it says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. Brothers and sisters, that same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to each one of us when we come to Him. Do you get that? It's available to you, to you, to you, to you, to me, and to everyone. We, we place our faith, our hope, our trust, and our lives in Jesus Christ's hands. But do you believe that? Do you? Here are some ways as a Christian that I have denied Jesus Christ. Maybe you can relate. I can have a complete conversation about myself and not once mention the life-changing power of Jesus Christ and what he's done. How about having a conversation with someone and they use JC or GD and not tell them that's, that's offensive? How about swearing? This is a huge one for a lot of men and women. How do you sound when no one's around? What is your speech like? Do you talk too much? Do you build up or tear down? Book of Proverbs tells us too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. In the book of James, it says you must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So how are we doing with that? What about our jokes, our humor? Ever made a joke about someone's disability, looks? You know the Bible hits all this head on. People say the Bible's not relevant. Well, I believe it's the most relevant thing that we have. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4, it says, Let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk or crude joking which are out of place. Instead, let there be thanksgiving. Here's one that destroys families, friendships, homes, and especially churches. And this disgusting sin, and it is a sin. It is a disgusting sin. And I've been the recipient of this, so I know how heartbreaking it can be. And this sin is called gossip. Anyone struggle with that? I have. When you gossip, you're in fact denying Christ. Because we know that in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says we all carry God's creation, image, and likeness. So when we gossip about someone, when we slander someone, we're actually slapping God in his face. It's so how about your free time? What are you doing with it? Is your free time about you? Then you're denying Jesus. Once you identify yourself as a follower of the living God, once you identify yourself as a born-again Christian, there is a huge bullseye on your back, brothers and sisters. You are a direct representative of the living God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just on Sundays, brothers and sisters. And we have no business acting or conducting ourselves like the world out there. So how about everyone here today? Are you present? I don't mean physically, I mean mentally. Or are we thinking about maybe lunch, our kids this afternoon, work? How about the music you're listening to? And now I know people are going to get a little crazy or call me legalistic, but there's certain songs I can't listen to because they bring me back to a time and a place when I didn't know Jesus Christ. They bring me back to somewhere that I was separated from God. And had I died then, I would be in hell. So how dare I glorify and glamorize something like that for me? How about your time in the Word, reading the Bible? Does it acknowledge Him, or does it in fact deny Jesus Christ? Let me ask this a different way, and I, I love this analogy. If you were on trial right now for being a born-again Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would your friendships, your relationships, your co-workers, would they all have enough evidence built up to prove you guilty as being a Christian? Here's another analogy. Anyone ever have a present? They, they're waiting. You see this present under this Christmas tree, right? And you're excited. I remember being a little kid getting a gift and being excited and all this hope and anticipation of what's in that gift. And then all of a sudden you open up that present and it is not what you wanted. It is not what you expected. It is, it's a letdown. Brothers and sisters, that's what we look like to the world when we present ourselves as born-again Christians and we act just like them. Brothers and sisters, the world is dying for Christians to start living out their faith. It's dying for us to be walking by faith and not by sight. We are direct representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is the problem with 
Republicans or Democrats or politicians or our culture, our society, the lost people out there? Or is the problem that we Christians are not living out the Christian life? The people of the world are seeing people who claim to be one thing, but acting like something else. Here's something that used to be a big struggle for me, not telling people that I'm a Christian when I meet someone new. And my wonderful wife has figured out a way to fix that. I don't wear anything but Jesus shirts. They're conversation starters, because I can wimp out sometimes. But that is also why I'm always with another brother when I'm out. That's why we go two by twos in the club for safety and also because that's biblical. Jesus sent out the apostles in twos. Earlier, when I asked who you are and what you do, not one of you said that you were a Christian, born again, a soul saver, transformed. Now I know I'm setting you up, and please forgive me, I do this sometimes and it's fun, but we're so used to giving our earthly titles. I'm Dr. So and so. I'm Officer So-and-so, I'm Fighter Fighter So-and-so, I'm former Marine Ethan. We forget that we have the greatest title on earth, Christian. We have the greatest title, the greatest name on earth, and we have to identify ourselves as such. So people, that, people will know who to turn to, brothers and sisters. You don't need years of time with someone day in and day out in hopes and anticipation that one day, someday, maybe you can tell them you're a closet Christian. No. No. Put it out there, brothers and sisters. People have to know who they can turn to in times of trouble. The reason, the reason is if we don't, it's actually selfish. It's selfish because when I don't tell someone that I'm a born-again Christian, I'm putting my own comfort and feelings before the lives of others. And I get it. It can be downright uncomfortable to share your faith. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, your feelings of comfort do not matter. Jesus does not give one iota about your feelings of comfort. He cares about lost souls, and he wants his people to care more about lost souls and going to hell than about offending someone or your social status at work. He cares about souls. Did the apostles live comfortable lives? No. How much do you have to hate someone not to tell them about Jesus Christ? How much do you have to hate someone to not warn them about heaven and hell? Or how in love with yourself do you have to be? I guess is the real question. The other problem with not telling people is that people die. So who's going to tell those people that don't have tomorrow? Who's going to tell them? We are. It is our job. It is our responsibility. Put it out there, brothers and sisters. I believe it's great to build relationships and foster relationships, but what type of relationship are we building if we're not telling people about our faith in Jesus Christ? If our faith is the most important thing on earth, why would we not want to share it? I guess the real question is, is your faith the most important thing? Is your relationship the most important thing? And of course, I want to jump up and say, yes, yes, but is it? Let me ask this another way. Maybe this will cut to the heart. Are there any people in your life, are there any people you know that don't know you're a follower of the Most High, that don't know you're a born-again Christian? Can you be a Christian and not talk about Christ? If I'm not talking about Jesus, it shows that he is not first in my life. I know why I used to keep my mouth shut. Because I wanted to continue in my sin. And when I told people that I was a Christian, it made it extremely difficult to continue in my sin. Imagine how that looks to the people of the world. You tell them you're a Christian, and then they see you acting just like they do. How does that look to them? Do you think that will win people to them? And even more, think of the one who's always watching. I use this analogy a lot, and I love it. You remember the old cigarette commercials in the 80s and 90s where we had animals smoking cigarettes? There was monkeys, lions, and turtles. Remember how ridiculous they looked? How stupid? Well, that's us. That's what we Christians look like when we act like the people out there. Brothers and sisters, the times we are in today are uncertain. We are a city on a hill. You must share your faith. This is not suggestive. It's an imperative. It's a must. It's an order. It's a command. This is our time to warn those around us. It is our time to warn this generation. And this chaos that we see going on outside should be a call calling us to rise up and stand up. And brothers and sisters, when we share our faith, we can show them why we have peace. 
We have peace even though everything around us is not peaceful. And we have peace because we have joy. And we have joy because we know at the end of the day the best is yet to come. And that is eternal glory. Oh, brothers and sisters, if you don't have that peace, if you don't have that joy, please see Pastor Mark, myself, or anyone here with me today, and we'll tell you how to get it. Better yet, we'll show you how to get it. Every single human being was created in the very image of God. Every single person has a soul and they matter. And their soul is going to go to heaven or hell. So the next time you look at someone who seems beyond hope, the next time you look at someone that is too far gone, the next time you see someone that is obnoxious or rude and you don't think there's any chance that they could come to Christ, look in the mirror. We've all looked that way to someone at some point. And no one is too far gone for Jesus to rescue. And I stand here a changed man as, as a result of him rescuing me. Brothers and sisters, we are Christians. Do you get that? We are set apart by God himself to proclaim his word to the lost. Brothers and sisters, it is our responsibility to warn this generation. And our time is running out. It is our responsibility to tell the people all about Jesus Christ and about heaven and hell, eternal life or eternal suffering. There is an utter excitement you will get when you walk into a situation and have no idea how it will go and insert Jesus into it. Oftentimes it doesn't go well and people don't want to hear about him. So what? Toughen up. Move on to the next one. Put it out there. Our job is to focus on obedience, not on the outcome. That is God's work. We can't control the outcome. We can only be obedient to him. So sitting here today, ask yourself this question. What does your life reflect? Does your life look like someone who was sold out for Jesus Christ? On fire for Jesus? In love with Jesus? Is Jesus the center of your life? Or is your life about you with a little Jesus added here or there when it's convenient? when you have time, when people are watching. But behind closed doors, when you're alone, you're different. Can we be honest? Brothers and sisters, if you're sitting here today and your life does not, does not look like Jesus and you're struggling, as I'm sure some of you are, stop doing what's not working. Today is a day to get right. Today is a day of salvation. The very power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is available to all of us here today. We just have to ask for it, and we have to believe that he's going to give it to us. You cannot be a closet Christian. You cannot pick and choose when you're a Christian. The reason it is so important is because we are to show people who they can turn to when everything else has failed them. If our lives are not attracted by the way we live, do you think you will win souls to Christ? I don't. Has everyone, anyone ever seen a miserable person? Or maybe a miserable person at church. Someone who's been a Christian forever or claims a title but has no joy. Call that the old lemon face. Who'd want that? Who'd be attracted to that? I wouldn't. I naturally steer clear of miserable people and so do most people. There's no room for miserable Christians. They do more harm than good. And that is completely contrary to the spirit that God has placed in us when we surrender our lives to him. When you are truly born again, you will have a new nature. We have the perfect picture of what our new nature looks like when we come to Jesus. It's found in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 20 through 22 and 23. And it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. These are not singular Meaning, you can't have one without the others. You can't say that I have love without joy. I have peace without patience. Kindness without goodness. Faithfulness without gentleness. And forget about self-control if the others aren't visible. We are to be gospel spreaders, brothers and sisters. Each one of us here today, I don't care what age you find yourself in, has a talent directly from God to advance his kingdom. We are gospel spreaders, brothers and sisters. And it's sad that many will never see the full potential that God has in their lives. We have to stand up, rise up as Christians. We have to put Jesus first in our lives so that others will see it. Today is a day of salvation, brothers and sisters. Today is a day that we become servants of God. Are you a servant? Are you sitting here today a servant of the Most High God? Or do you expect people to serve you? If you don't know Jesus Christ personally, if you're sitting here today and you've not made a commitment to follow him, today is the day. Today is the day to get right. Maybe you are a Christian, 
But you've been playing with one foot in the world and one foot in eternity. Maybe you've been playing both sides of the field. Today is the day to stake a stand. Today is the day to get right. Maybe you've been more of a fan than a follower of Jesus Christ. Today is the day to step over the line and say, I believe. I believe and I will stand firm. Don't wait any longer, brothers and sisters. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. We all have an incurable disease of death, meaning one in one of us will die. Most likely, someone here today will not be here, myself included, within a year. Are you ready? Are you prepared? What does your life reflect? Today is the day of salvation, brothers and sisters. Today is the day to get right with Jesus Christ. Don't wait. Come to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus today. There are 4,200 religions in the world and only one empty tomb, and that is because our God holds the entire universe in his hand. Our God is Emmanuel. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Lamb of God. He is the way, the truth, the life. He is the bright morning star. He is the lion in the tribe of Judah. He gives sight to the blind. He gives a home to the hopeless, hope to the hopeless. He gives worth to the worthless. He rescues lost souls. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he's knocking at your door. And will you let him in? Oh, brothers and sisters, it is great to serve a risen Savior. It is great to be in the house of God. But I ask you this, what does your life reflect? And if it does not reflect Jesus Christ, if it does not reflect the cross of Christ, then take a stand. And get down on your knees and cry out to him. Ask him to forgive you and get up and get moving. Thank you. Father, I thank you for this church, Lord. I thank you for each man and woman that's here. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, you'd speak into us, Lord. Give us a boldness. You tell us that perfect love casts all cast off all fear, Lord. And I pray that we'd be fearless. We'd be bold as lions, Lord. That we would go out there and impact the world, Father. That we would be a big brick thrown into a pond so that we get waves, not ripples, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to be here today, Lord. But I thank you first and foremost for you dying for my sins, for resurrecting me, for redeeming me. You gave worth to this worthless man. You gave a title greater than any title I could ever have. And I thank you for that, Father. I thank you for the work you did on that cross, Lord. And you didn't have to, but you wanted to for us. Now may the Lord keep you and bless you. Make, may he make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you always. Go in peace, brothers and sisters. Amen.